Hello, everybody. Um, this is the first time I'm ever doing anything like this. Um, I gave this talk back in October, but to uh, to a room full of people, and now I'm sitting in an empty room, uh, <laughs> looking at my computer, and I don't even see any of your faces right now. So um, it's an interesting experience, but I am really happy to to have the opportunity to share this presentation with you because it really was um, something that I enjoyed researching and and putting together. Um, and yeah, so let's dive right in. So the top, the topic will be um, Hamid Mahout. Um, hold on one second. It's not wanting to move on. Hold on. Okay, so in presentation mode, and then should be able to. All right, let's start it like this. Maybe that's better. We see it. Okay. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So, um, all right. So what led me to this? Um, so essentially, I am, um, for those who don't know me, which are many, um, I am from Syria. I was born in Syria, but I actually grew up in the U.S. And um, we would spend summers, every single summer, we would go back to Damascus. Um, and especially when I was younger, we would stay in my grandfather's house. Uh, so it would be a bunch of cousins all piled into this one apartment. And we often drove my grandfather crazy um, with all the, the running down the halls and the playing and the doing all kinds of things. And there was this one day that he just literally piled us all up in front of the TV. And like any frustrated adult with the uh, overactive children, put in a, a, a tape into the VCR and said, watch this. And so what he had actually popped into the VCR was um, a play by uh, Dured Laham called Gherbe. Um And we absolutely fell in love with it. It was, uh, it was filled with um, songs and dances. And there was this really funny guy with, with a mustache and, and a fez and these dark rimmed glasses. And he was hilarious. And so we, uh, we watched it many, many, many times that summer. And, you know, subsequent summers, we ended up watching the two other plays that or he was also um, famous for. Uh, and I really didn't know at the time um, anything about Muhammad Mahout, who was the actual um, playwright of these plays. Um, and I didn't also understand the, the many um, sort of uh, serious topics that he was really addressing. Um, as, as we watched them and grew up watching them, um, they ultimately played a significant role in shaping my understanding of Syrian and broader Arab history, um, uh, social and political history. Um, so, my, the presenter's promise for this, uh, for this Afrika talk, of course, is that I'm not an expert, um, but I do promise that I tried to learn as much as I could to satisfy my curiosity about this topic. Um, there might be someone here who knows more about me, um, more than me, sorry, about this topic. So please feel free to, to correct or ask questions, but of course, do it nicely. Um, I'm also not trying to persuade you of my agenda or convince you to take any action. My only hope is that my presentation will cultivate your own curiosities. Um, and that if you haven't seen these plays that we're going to be discussing, that you will be curious to watch them. So my question for this presentation is, how does Muhammad Mahout use satire to explore attachment to the homeland? Uh, we're going to look at first uh, some uh, social historical context, uh, the world that he was born into, um, his own life and work, as well as the, the common themes that he explored through specifically three of his most popular plays, the three plays that he collaborated with Dure Laham, uh, which they are Dayat Tishtin, Gurbe, and Kasakya Wapan. We'll be talking about those uh, in, in more depth. So first, um, there's essentially three things um, that you need to know about 
about uh, the, you know, the world that Maghub was born into. Um, one is that there was a French mandate from 1918 to 1946. Syria lived under French rule, and there was a long and bloody battle for independence. Um, you know, Syrians, of course, were united during that time because there was one common goal. However, after independence, uh, Syrian leaders no longer had this, this one goal, and so there was you know, no longer that unity, and it was a period that was characterized by frequent coups and revolts, civil disorders, riots, um, and a lack of cohesion and direction. And then, of course, uh, against that backdrop of internal strife, you have um, a very significant you know, external conflict, which is, of course, the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Um, that was you know, the beginning of, obviously, a long and drawn out uh, conflict um, that continues until today, uh, one that has you know, sharply shaped the, the Arab world. Um, two things, in, two wars in particular, that are important markers of this conflict um, during Mahmoud's life anyway. In 1967, um, there was the Six Day War, which was a humiliating defeat of the Arab armies by Israel, a tremendous loss of territory and further displacement of uh, the Palestinian people. And then of course in 1973, the October War, which was um, not necessarily a victory in terms of its you know, territorial um, you know, reclaiming of territory, but more of a symbolic redemption um, for the Arabs after the humiliation of uh, 1967. And the last thing to talk about really is um, the, uh, the Ba'ath Revolution 1963, the coup that took place in Syria. Um, the Ba'ath Party and the revolution um, was uh, very much centered on pan-Arab nationalism uh, it was socialist, of course, so we had a lot of agrarian reform and farm cooperatives um, sort of moving from a, a feudal system into a more uh, socialist system. Uh, it also brought about tremendous uh, centralization, so a lot of the bureaucracy and uh, ultimately also a, a, a sharp limitation of creativity and um, the work of intellectuals. Freedom of expression was really very much uh, impacted by this coup and by this revolution. Sorry, Nisreen, can you repeat when was he born again? Just so we can get a sense of how old he was when all this was happening. Sure, actually that is coming right up. So he oh, was born, coming. yeah, he was born in 1934 in a town near Hama called Salamiye. Wow, this um, is beautiful. Yes, this is um, courtesy of Google. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the town that he's from actually it was, has a, a long history of rebellion, um, a long history of uh, being marginalized and suffering from sort of government neglect. And his own father was a farmer, and so he grew up in poverty. When he was 14, he moved to Damascus, um, but he, to, to continue his studies, to, to be able to go to school. Um, but he actually never finished his formal schooling, and the reasons for that were not... Uh, clear to me in my research. I wasn't able to find exactly why that was, but, um, but it is something important to note because he really went on to be a, quite a prolific writer um, and, a, and a brilliant man, you know, so, so that's interesting. Um, as an adult, in his early 20s, he joined the Syrian Socialist Nationalist Party. Um, and what's interesting to note here is that he chose this party over the Ba'ath Party not for ideological reasons, but really because it was closer to his home and because it had a heater, whereas the Ba'ath Party apparently <laughs> did not have a heater. Um, yeah. and, so, and this is, I think, interesting because we can see that he was not ideologically driven. Um, he was someone who you know, grew up poor and was really looking you know, for um, just to, to have his needs met, essentially, and, uh, and that he was more concerned with sort of the humanity of people rather than necessarily political ideology. Um, his decision to join the SSNP, of course, had a tremendous impact on his life because he was imprisoned in two different, uh, on two different occasions, once for nine months when he was 21, um, and then a few years later, um, in 1961, uh, and both times because of the crackdown, a government crackdown on the, on the party that he was a member of. When he was in prison, 
um, he met the renowned uh, Syrian poet Adonis, and this is what sort of started his own um, his own poet you know uh, career of writing poetry, his love of poetry, um, and. He, he also suffered a, a lot of torture, of course, while, while in prison. And later in an interview with the Hayat uh, newspaper, he shared this quote, um, something inside of me was broken that hasn't been repaired even until today. Referring specifically to torture or? Yes, referring specifically <laughs> to the torture that he endured. This is, uh, he wasn't particularly like special for having been in prison. This was quite commonplace for anyone who was associated with the party, essentially. Yes, I'm, uh, I mean, I can't speak too much yeah. to, the, to the political history. But, um, but yes, I mean, if there wasn't anything that he in particular did or that he was imprisoned for. Yeah. It was, the, what I read was that he, it was a, a general crackdown on the party and its members. Yeah. Um, so, so we'll talk a little bit about his work, um, his general, before delving into the place. Um, he is known for being the father of the Arabic free verse poetry. So, um, like we said, he started out really uh, writing poetry, and this was revolutionary uh, in terms of the structure of the Arabic poem. Um, he lived in self-exile in Beirut uh, as a result of this um, Ba'ath uh, revolution and takeover. There was, um, like we said before, you know, a, a tremendous impact on the intellectual life in, uh, in Syria, and so many uh, intellectuals lived in Beirut. He published poetry in literary journals, as well as numerous collections, some titles of the collections, just to give you a sense of his work, um, Sadness in the Moonlight, A Room with, a mil with Millions of Walls, uh, Joy is Not My Profession. Um, so, you know, you can get a sense that he was, um, you know, he wrote a sort of dark and more somber themes. Um, and that, uh, that really characterized his work. Uh, he also began writing plays uh, in 1965, started with uh, one-act plays, and then moved into you know, many, the, uh, three of which were in collaboration with um, Dure Dlaha. So the themes that he really sort of explored um, like I said, it's you know kind of on the darker side. Um, he's known for his darkly comic and satiric nature of his writing, uh, which he used to highlight the ethical decline and corruption of Arab leaders, uh, rise of totalitarian governments, social misery, and the disenfranchisement of the common man. Ignorance and a lack of education is a tool to control population, uh, to control the, the local population. Um, and what I found when I was uh, sort of researching him, but more so when I was, you know, watching these three plays that I had grown up watching and sort of was watching them again with a different sort of, through a different lens, um, was uh, sort of the interplay of three major concepts. Um, he, he really explores kind of the relationship between uh, the homeland and Wotan, the citizen, Muatin, and power and that especially that of a corrupt power. And it, it seemed to me that the question that really kind of comes through in all of these plays is how does the tension between the disenfranchised citizen and an unjust power impact personal identity and love of country? Yeah. This is one of, uh, you know, a, a very famous quote that is attributed to him and it's from his collection of essays called uh, I Will Betray My Homeland. Um, and says, he says in it, there is only one perfect crime and it is to be born an Arab. Uh, sadly, this is a sentiment that I think is probably even more true today um, in the Arab world. It's not something that we've grown out of. Um, and it, it definitely shaped a lot of his writing, I think. So we'll, uh, we'll look at these three plays, which um, again, the, address these three themes. Um, they explore the themes and I think they also create representations of uh, a corrupt and unjust power, the disenfranchised citizen or citizenry, and you know, how that sort of affects the attachment to homeland. Um, these three concepts are filtered through 
an absurdist and satiric lens to comment on the backward state of Muggles' world. And I just want to say here that, you know, one of the things that always struck me about um, these plays is, and, and the sort of brilliance of Muggled and Dunit Zahram together, really, um, was to be able to create these, um, these works that were, as, as a child, so captivating and so entertaining and so sort of um, just compelling, you know, for even a child, um, at, while at the same time addressing very dark and um, serious realities. Did you, um, you were drawn to the, do you think you were drawn only to like sort of the absurdity of it as a child or um, the, the like? The absurdity yeah. of it or like the, what drew me to it later in life is it like the, my admire later when realizing how sort of dark and serious um, the subject matter really was. Uh, I sort of looking back on it, I feel like it's, it's so interesting and it's like a real work of, um, of uh, what's the word, like a, his craft, like his, the, the ability to handle such dark and serious themes in a way that is just, that, you know, you find yourself laughing, you find yourself um, sort of compelled and captivated in, in these un in unexpected ways. Um, yeah. Great, great, yeah. Okay, so the three plays that we're going to talk about are Bayat um, Tashreen, which uh, was uh, per produced, performed in 1974, Ghurbi, which was performed in 1976, and Kasak Yawatan, which um, I found varying dates. So it's circa 1980. Uh, it might have been a little bit later, but I'm not really quite sure. So Zayat uh, translates to October village and October is of course the, you know, the symbolic, uh, the significance of it is the, that final war that I told you about before, um, the sort of symbolic uh, victory or redemption at least of the Arab, uh, the Arab leaders, the Arab governments, the Arab world, you know, the sense of um, that there was some redemption after the, the defeat in 1967. Um, in any case, uh, this play is, talks about Naif and Zena, uh, a couple in this village, whose wedding is cut short when news comes that her dowry, which is a vineyard, has been stolen. You know, somebody has come and settled on the land. And so, of course, this is a metaphorical account of the Arab-Israeli conflict beginning with the loss of Palestine and the political and social fallout in the Arab world. Um, it's a metaphor not only for the loss of Palestine, but really for the entire Arab nation as sort of a stillborn nation. In this play, power is represented um, by the Mukhtar. The Mukhtar is the, Mukhtar translates to mayor, um, or you know, the leader, and his henchmen. And um, in, in the play, he is, uh, he's kind of foolish, he's a little bit, you know, not very much concerned with the, the people of the village, a bit self-serving, you know, definitely corrupt, incompetent, and he's not really doing much to solve this, this very ex existential issue of the, of the stolen vineyard. Um, and so people become frustrated with his incompetence and, and he's eventually overthrown. Um, and in a, you know, brilliant sort of satiric move, the new Mukhtar who comes in in his place is of course played by the same actor. But even this new Mukhtar um, the new Mukhtar doesn't last either because revolution begets revolution and it produces a never ending succession of fools. So each, with each revolution, a, a new leader comes out wearing a different hat. So you can see all here, all four examples. Um, that, so there are essentially <laughs> four uh, cycles of these, uh, of these revolutions and each time he comes out wearing a different hat and speaking with a slightly different voice. But of course, each time recites the exact same speech with not a single word changed. Um, and what you see is that the, the people who, you know, as they're sort of seeing the, the, these changes happening, um, in the beginning, they're very optimistic, they're hopeful, they're cheering to the speech, you know, it's exactly what they've been wanting. And by the third and fourth time, they're just like, they are recited, re reciting the speech themselves. They're not at all, you know, convinced by what this person has to offer. Um, the very last one, they, they look kind of like this, crazed sort of circus, you know, they've just kind of gone crazy. 
and one person singing over there, another person's dancing over there, like they, they're not taking anything seriously. Um, and so, you know, you have a really, a very much a, a jaded and uh, disillusioned um, group of people. Ms. Treen, is this the same like uh, troupe? Is this the same sort of theater troupe that's, somebody in the chat asked uh, about how he and Laham got to know each other. Are they part of the same theater troupe that's like producing these plays? Uh, how Mahvoud and Laham got to know each other? Yeah, like um, mm -hmm. these are all plays. So is it the same theater troupe that's like putting them on in the same location? Yeah. Are they? Um, it's not, it was, yes, there was, uh, so Dure Laham had created a theater troupe with um, another actor uh, named Omar Hajjo. And it was called, I believe it was even called uh, like October Troop, like the Tishreen or something like that. Um, and, uh, but the collaboration was very, yeah. So they, so across the three plays, you have many of the same actors, although not, although not necessarily, like some, some uh, don't necessarily partake in all. So yeah. Cool. Right. Okay. So, um, and, with and each, just following yeah. up on that, how did uh, how did he and and um, uh, and Laham meet? I think that's a question that that Bader had. Yes, um, you know, I'm, I don't actually that did not come across in my research um, how exactly they they met. Um, I just know that that, that that it was a collaboration across these three plays. I'm not sure if anybody else uh, who is listening in on, on this or is in the meeting, the call, might know that, but that did not come across in my research. And I should also say that my research was limited to English resources. As I said, I grew up in the States, <laughs> so um, I wasn't able to access any Arabic resources for my research. Shall I move on? Yeah, keep on going. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, so, all right, so the more things change, the, uh, the more things sort of stay the same, really. And uh, nothing has progressed in terms of reclaiming the stolen vineyard. But really, what's, the only thing that's changing is the fact that the um, people are becoming poorer and the government is becoming more sort of uh, repressive. And each new ruler is more concerned with safeguarding his power rather than actually governing. And so we see a rise in repressive, repressive practices, which is you know, kind of captured in this still from the play with the security agent sort of standing there waiting to hear any sort of dissent. And of course, the, the common man who has been reduced to begging in rags. Um, in the following scene, um, this is Naif, who was the groom. Uh, and he's, uh, he's kind of complaining to his friend Hawar, um about about the situation, about how the government's not helping, how you know we need to change, and of course the security agent comes to um, to take them to, for interrogation. He, he detains them both, um, even though Rawad was sitting quietly and not spe not saying anything. Um, they ultimately get uh, sort of you know beaten up a bit in in jail and in, in the prison, um, and in this scene. The, uh, the agent is really, you know, humiliating and beating him down. Um, and it sort of culminates in this conversation where he's just uh, breaking him and says to him, you know, what are you, a man? No, sir. Then what? A woman? No, sir. Then what? And he sort of breaks down and screams, I am nothing. I am a citizen. I am nothing. And in that moment, of course, we can see that um, you know, it, the citizen has now been reduced to to completely nothing and of no significance. Um, and so it's at this point that you know, sort of everything is kind of very much uh, in despair. Um, there's a very sort of humorous but uh, bitter, bitterly humorous um, scene of a drunken debki, uh, which is sort of an artistic way of of a, expressing this, uh, this state of mind, I guess. Um, and the, 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 the dilemma really becomes, how does the citizen reconcile their attachment to this place that has been made so unlivable by those in power? What, um, what kind of uh, impact does this have on their identity and their sense of attachment to the homeland? 
Um, and this attachment is, uh, is, becomes really clear in this one scene, or this, this questioning of the attachment um, becomes clear in this scene um, when there is a very humiliating defeat to restore the stolen vineyard. The men of the village go to try to fight and reclaim it, but in, instead are, are, you know, horribly defeated. Of course, this is a symbol for the 1967 war. Um, and the leader, the Mukhtar, he shames them for not fighting and dying for the land, al Watan. And what Ghawar does, the character that's pictured here, is you know, he, he sort of, he calls out this idea that, that, that we should somehow sacrifice for the land when the, when the, you know, the government has not done anything to really honor and protect those living in them. So, you know, what you see when the Bukhtar is saying that you should have died for the land is kind of this appropriation of this idea of homeland, of attachment to the homeland, um, and, and using it for their own sort of, uh, their own agenda. And, and Rawad calls them out on it, basically posing the question, what value does the land have without the people and the citizens on it? Um, he then goes on to describe sort of, you know, the, the, the miserable state that the, the village is in and asks, you know, what is it exactly that you want me to defend? Do you want me to defend that I can't open my mouth anywhere unless I go to the dentist? Do you want me to defend my shoe size that has, you know, uh, is two sizes larger because of the beatings that I've received in prison? Um, and, you know, at the end of it, he says, uh, he, he sort of, when, when, some, when the Mukhtar asks, who is this speaking? He says, it is Ghawar, it is the citizen Ghawar who is speaking. And so he's kind of reclaiming this idea of the citizen as one who is, um, who is empowered and can speak and not nothing. Uh, okay, so that is really kind of the, the gist of, of that play. And uh, this brings us to the next play, um, unless there's any questions related to the, the first play. Um, I, I just have one question about the sort of reception of the play. So the play was was you know put on just in a, in a theater uh, as opposed to, yeah. and then it's later on that it made its way to TV. Yeah. So um, the plays were all performed, um, but the recordings of the play um, being performed live on stage is what has been circulating, and it was what you can find on YouTube and what I watched growing up. So it's, uh, it's the actual performance on stage. But the Red was already a, a TV star at this point. Like Gawad was, a, uh, was a, yes. a cultural icon already. Right. He was a well-known character. Yeah. Yes, he was. And that actually, that is something that I um, skipped over uh, briefly, just to say that Gawad as a character is kind of this iconic everyman character. And he's, he's featured in each, excuse me, he's featured in each play, but um, never with sort of, like the same personal history or like circumstances, you know, he's yeah. a completely different character each time, but, but um, it's just, he's a symbolic sort of every right. man. He's like an archetypal type yeah. of character. Yes, definitely. Um, okay, so this next play um, called Ghurbe, which means estrangement, uh, was, uh, was performed in 1976. And it deals with the phenomenon of uh, mass Arab urbanization and emigration to the West during the 70s. It's set in a rural village called Ghurbi, and this uh, village is kind of a symbol of the Arab homeland. And th its translation of estrangement is really kind of a statement on um, how Arabs feel within their homeland. So the, the, the relationship that um, one has to their homeland as being one of estrangement or exile. Um, it's a five-act play, and it really highlights the injustice uh, suffered by the rural population. Uh, in this play, power is represented first by the Beik. He's a shrewd feudal landowner. Um, he's the guy in the with the fez, and he's uh, he, he's ruthless. He's, you know, he rules through fear and intimidation. He exploits the farmers of the village. Um, and he's always flanked by these two henchmen with the black hats. Um, and so in the beginning of the play, uh, a, a teacher has come from the capital to, you know, this rural village sort of on the, on the outskirts. And his intention is to open a school because this village doesn't have a school. And of course, this threatens 
um, the bake very much because that's going to change the social order. He's not so happy about it. So we're actually going to watch a little clip. I'm really hoping this works. Technology gods smile upon us. Okay. And the subtitling, there should be English subtitles. And let's, let's give a round of applause for Nasreen who literally did all the subtitles manually. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> except, except one of the clips, which I'll, I'll say. Anyway, let's see. Oh, good gosh. Why? All right, it worked when I tested it out. So let's. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Okay. I'm going to try to figure out, sorry, real quick. Can I stop share and just figure out what I need to turn the subtitles on? Is that okay? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, you can. Right, I don't know how to do that though. I know I, I can do it, just it's from where I am. Hold on. Sorry, people, one second. Okay. Okay, I think that should be good. Okay, present mode and all right, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> واحد عميل قال جاي يعملنا مدرسة هون مين؟ <تصفيق> انت فلا ولا ما بيكفي المذبحة اللي عملت لنا اياها بعيد الكذب تعال شوف قمر قال لك تعال ولك يا ابني انت شو فكرك الدولة سايبة هون ليش شو عملت؟ جاي تفتح مدرسة للمعترين ما بتخاف الله؟ لاني بخاف الله جاي افتح لهم مدرسة قبل ما تفتح لهم مدرسة روح صلح لهم سقف الحبس صار له سنتين عم يدلف على المساجين المساكين ما في بقلبك رحمة بتضيع في سجن وما في مدرسة سجن واحد استكثرتوا على هالشعب الفقير ولك السجن مدرسة إذا أعددتها أعددت شعبا طيب الأعناق ولك هذا شعب لازمه مدرسة ها ولك هذا الشعب يلي لازمه مدرسة لك لشو؟ لك لماذا عليه جهل لماذا عليه التخلف؟ الله الله بينت نواياك يا ابن الحرام ما باقي عنا غير هالشوية جهل وتخلف رافعين راسنا فيهم جاي تقضي عليهم الله لا يوفق لا لا ولا دولتنا شو بيقولوا لها؟ دولة متخلفة إذا هالحرامي سرق لنا التخلف شو مصير دولة شو؟ عمركم سمعتوا دولة اسمها شو؟ Okay. Any any responses or thoughts about the clip? I mean, hmm? I can understand why you'd be you would both be interested in it as a, a child and as an adult. I mean, it, it, it's like every great satire. It is it toes this this line. Well, but yeah. it's also if if you squint, it's slapstick. Yeah. Right. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's definitely a lot of uh, the slapstick aspect of it because uh, there's a lot more of like similarly, like even more hilarious scenes, slapstick type scenes um, in that play in particular, I think, and literally more so than the others um, that really, yeah, as, as a child, we just we were, we were in love um, yeah. and we were just yeah rolling. Um, uh, but yeah, so um, so you can see how he sort of uses this the, the humor and the the way of like you know talking about you know we should be proud of our ignorance and we're you know this is what we want and whatever. Um, so um, so in any case, uh, ultimately the there is uh, the, the socialist revolution of course happens, and um, 
you know, feudal landowners like the big are, are sort of pushed aside. Um, and, but with the socialist revolution, of course, comes again, this highly centralized bureaucratic system that is just as corrupt um, and, and uh, you know, callous towards um, the, the rights of the people and the, the well-being of the people. Um, and this sort of, this disillusionment or this disappointment of this new reality is, is summed up in, the, in you know, one of the characters says, we thought we had gotten rid of the bake, but now we have 100 bakes in his place. So <laughs> the, all of this, uh, this, this disillus disillusionment essentially with the promises of the socialist revolution and you know, the fact that there would be equality, that the, the working class will, will rise up. Um, you know, when they saw that this was kind of you know, empty promises and more bureaucracy was created and people just as, uh, sorry, in the slide before, this character, the one who's sort of holding the pipe and with the gloves, um, he was a part of the village. He was one of the villagers. They had sent him to the capital to try to fight for their, you know, and like advocate for the rights of the village. Um, and, and he sort of got sucked up into the, uh, the state apparatus and sort of got his own and became just as corrupt as the, as the rest. Um, so he sort of encompasses and, and, and symbolizes that. Uh, so here we have this, um, this sort of exodus, essentially, um, from the villages first to the capital city, um, and, then, uh, and then, of course, to the west. Um, make sure I'm not missing something here. Uh, and so what you have here is all of the men leaving. And of course, the two women who are standing there, this is the Hajji, the woman, the woman with the cane, the older woman. She's kind of the matriarch of the village. Um, and she's begging them basically not to go. And she says, uh, you won't be able to live without the land. Um, and she, she's like a mother begging her child not to leave. You know, as she says, I have but a few days left in this world. Don't let me die brokenhearted. Ultimately, they leave. They say, we want to live. We need to, we need to seek opportunity elsewhere. And which is ultimately what the play is about, you know, this estrangement and exile. Uh, only one, you know, sort of short scene actually takes place in the West. Um, and we can see here that they're kind of, in, you know, reduced to numbers. They're working in a factory. Um, each, uh, just in this one scene, each character represents a different Arab country. Um, and like I said, they're, they're reduced to numbers. So a fight breaks out between two of them. When one refers to the other, he calls him by his number rather than his name. And uh, you know, enraged, he says, you know, my name is not a number. I have a name and my name is Abu Zulaf. I am from a village called Lirbi. And if you don't believe me, ask Hajji. She brought me into this world and she named me Abu Zulaf. The other man apologizes, he says, and he says to him, uh, he who puts his homeland in a suitcase becomes a number. Forgive me, Abu Zulaf. We are all heartbroken and yearn for our names. And so in this moment, you feel the, you know, the, just the, the sadness and, and real sense of loss of having left the homeland. Um, and again, you know, this sort of reality that's been brought about by, um, by forces, you know, by, by the situation at home in which the, this corrupt power has has led led people to flee to leave their homes Ms. Reen, can you sort of talk a little bit about this um the matriarch and the sort of the female imagery in in this yeah. play in particular yes um so uh, this play also i feel like there's a there's a whole other talk that could be given about um this play in particular a little bit and um the way it sort of represents the the women and um, and at one point I think I was like in college when I had seen it for the first time in a long time and I was like oh my god this play is all about like you know female power um, and it was a completely different lens um, the play actually opens up with all of the women going into the field this sort of yeah. similar silhouette to this um, except it's women going to work in the field and then the, the lights come up onto the stage and it's uh, all of the men kind of sitting in the coffee house um, and just sort of talking, like singing about their, their might and their prowess, but really not doing anything. Um, and it's kind of the women who have been 
doing all the all of the the work in the village and the matriarch herself she's you know she's the only one who can stand up to the bake she's the only one who can um and she sort of is always speaking truth to power and speaking um even truth to the men you know t- telling them to get off their butts and to you know um she holds them to account essentially um and and she's really a symbol of of the homeland um and in many ways so anyway that's so yeah she's a powerful uh character and it's a yeah it's a very interesting sort of way that they represent that they that he talks about the the role of women in society and that sort of that fundamental role that they play okay um so we're to our third play here, Kasak Yawapan, um, one of actually, I think, the more famous of the three. Um, and it's, uh, it translates to Cheers Homeland. Uh, in this play, the, the protagonist is the sort of everyman Rawad that we talked about earlier. Um, and he is the proud son of a martyr in the war against the French. Um, he's this sort of like hopelessly optimistic character uh, and believes all of the government's promises. He go, walks around carrying the newspaper and like believes everything that he reads in the newspaper that they, there's all of these projects, there's going to be development, there's all of these things. Um, and he's just, you know, uh, you know, an essentially good person and just full of hope. Um, however, unfortunately, throughout the play, uh, we see him go through a series of personal tragedies uh, at the hands of a corrupt state. In this play, what's interesting is that power is not depicted by one leader or figurehead, but there's actually many different players that make up the apparatus of the state. Um, they're all corrupt and inhumane and self-serving in their own ways, but there you see it on a much more kind of uh, decentralized way, perhaps. Um, this first sort of tragic encounter that he has with the corruption and injustice of the state is when his daughter, who he is like overjoyed having, um, and her name is Ahlam, which means, uh, which translates to dreams. Um, he it takes her to the hospital because she has a fever and the nurse is very kind of cold and you know, whatever the doctor's not here and stop pacing and you know, whatever, she's not very kind to him. Uh, he, he finally has, you know, the doctor finally arrives, he goes in to see him but his turn is taken by a wealthy diplomat. Uh, The diplomat comes in and he, you know, describes uh, his problem to the doctor. Um, He says, you know, basically that his problem is, is that he is a, you know, he travels around the world. And of course he has um, many uh, uh, encounters with beautiful women. And as of late, he hasn't been able to perform sexually. And so this is of course, a deeply embarrassing situation for the country. You know, this is not, I, I was so embarrassed to tell her which country I was from because I needed to protect the reputation of the homeland. And the doctor says to him, of course, yes, you've always been a faithful servant of the homeland. Uh, so meanwhile, uh, Rawad's daughter's fever continues to rise and the nurse is of course barring him from entering to see the doctor. And ultimately, sorry, um, and ultimately she dies in his arms. So this is the first major tragedy that sort of uh, sets the play. And the nurse kind of casually says like, oh, what, she died? And he says, no, if only she was murdered. Um, Of course, from that point on, he tries uh, to get justice. He's, you know, going from you know, government aid, uh, office to government office, trying to file a complaint, trying to get um, the press, anybody to sort of you know, listen to, his, to what happened to him. Um, but there's really, there's no use. And he continues to be shackled by poverty. He has no, you know, he's, he's kind of, uh, he's not really swimming in, in big bucks. And he refuses to, um, to do things that other people are doing in the country to get by, by taking bribes or, you know, whatever it is engaging in corrupt behavior. Um, and he's ultimately detained uh, and tortured, uh, sort of interrogated um, because of all of this sort of ruckus that he's creating by, by going around and, and lodging complaints about what happened to his daughter. And so we have here another kind of interrogation scene 
Um, and what's interesting here is that, uh, so he, he sort of like takes the interrogation scene and flips it on its head, right? Because, you know, torture is a place, is, a, is a, obviously a very dark uh, act and, you know, something that's um, one, a scene in which you wouldn't expect this kind of casual repartee. But that's sort of exactly what he does. Um, he creates a, a scene that is full of repartee and in, in it, Rouad is kind of this unflappable, very calm, cool and collected, um, witty, uh, you know, and sort of is in charge of these two buffoons who are trying to interrogate him, trying to torture him, trying to break him essentially. But he sort of maintains the upper hand um, and, and kind of has them flustered. Uh, he sort of tells them to get him tea or coffee. He asks for um, a pen and paper to be able to write his memoirs. You know, it's, and it's, it's a very humorous scene. It's actually one of the best scenes of the play. Um, we're gonna watch a very short part of it. I did not actually do the subtitles for this one. I found them already done on YouTube. Um, so they're not amazing, but they, they get the job done. Uh, let's watch. حطوا على الكهرباء حطينا سيدي وما استفدنا شيء يا سيدي حطني على كهرباء 110 فولت شو بدك تكفيني ال110 فولت بالغلاء وعلى قد ايش بدك انا اقل من 220 فولت ما بحس عندكم ترانس <تصفيق> حطوا على 220 ايه هذا كلام <تصفيق> أصبح وألقي القبض علي بتاريخ 220 ذو القعدة وقعدوني بالقابوش سلم يديك سيدي 220 وما عم تأثر كمان ها سيدي ما له حاطط الفيش بالبريز طيب يا حبيبي يا حبيبي إيه والله طوشني مذكرات وتحقيق إيه شو نحن بالسويد وبعد ذلك ها تيجي شيء ولك عم تضحك بدل ما تصرخ نعم سيدي عم بضحك شنو بلا معنى الكهرباء وصلت لعفاي قبل ما تصل لضيعتنا <تصفيق> There are a lot of really great lines in that scene um, and I added a few more here just to because I couldn't get the whole scene um, so the first one we just heard I'm laughing because beg your pardon, the, the electricity has reached my ass before it reached our village. And uh, later he sort of like begs them to continue, like they stop because he's enjoying it too much. And he's kind of like, no, 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 please, please keep going, keep going. Um, and uh, he says, may God shine this light upon you the way that you have lit up my behind. Um, and, uh, and says, you know, maybe I can go back to my village with my ass raised high because, you know, his ass has seen electricity, whereas his village has not. Um, so... Here again, you have this sort of like biting satire and, and humor, uh, which is brilliantly done and, and you know, also extremely sad. Um, so, okay. Uh, his life continues in a downward spiral. He ultimately um, cannot provide for his family. He's sort of drowning in his poverty. He ends up selling his children, which again is a, and one of those, another very brilliantly dark yet comical scenes. Um, he's selling them as if he's selling like, like it's a very much like a market bazaar kind of scene, you know? Um, and uh, his wife ultimately leaves him. And in the final scene of the play, he's sort of taken whatever last bit of money he has to buy a bottle of Arap, um, a common alcoholic drink. And, uh, and drinks basically to numb his pain. And this is the final scene um, in which he sort of, he receives a, a, in his drunken stupor, he basically hallucinates a phone call with, or a conversation 
uh, with his martyred father. And this is what we're going to see now. I'm going to pause it um, at one point. Hopefully, I don't mess up anything technically. Um, just to, because I, I condensed it a little bit so that uh, it would fit in for time. Okay. الو يا اخونا ارفع السماعه في لك مخابره نحن ما عندنا تليفون ارفع السماعه نحن حكينا فيها يعني صرتوا بلد وحده يا يا جيز اوكي او نو نو جو باك اي ويل جو باك هولد اون اوه اول رايت We might need it to was just getting that. good. <laughs> it was. Okay, basically, before I play it again, we'll watch it all the way through, if you don't mind, again. Um, and I won't pause it. But basically, just uh, where it's edited, he, so first he asks about, you know, the Arab unity. And he says, yeah, yeah, of course, we don't talk about that anymore. It's all taken care of. And then he goes on to explain many other things that have become wonderful and great. Um, that's, I've edited that part out. Okay, and then the father asks him something else. Okay, so we'll just watch it all again. Sorry, and uh, I won't pause it. Hello, ya akhuna. Shfaa al-samaa fi lak mukhabara. Nihna ma anna telefoon. Irfaa al-samaa mukhabara kharjiye. Min min al-mukhabara? Min abuk. Lak abi mat min zaman un salat azamu maka'ahe. Irfaa al-samaa huwa li talba. Shdoon salat li? الاحياء مع ما يحكوا معنا يحكوا معنا الاموال الو نعم انا المرحوم ابوك نينا بتحكي يا ابي الشهيد وين بيكون؟ والله ما بعرف يا ابي شني ما استشهدت ولا مره لسان من الجنه يا ولدي الله يطعمك ياها والسامعين يا ابي يا ابي انت ليش استشهدت لك؟ شو بدك بهالصرعه كان؟ من شان الوطن شو نسيت؟ والله راح عن بالي الوطن يا ابي حلوه الجنه يا ابي ما في مثل الجنه بس حتى الجنه ما بتغني عن الوطن يا ولدي طن مني شو صار فيكم؟ شو صار بالاشياء يلي استشهدنا من شانها؟ طمن يا ابي الحمد لله دمكم ما راح هدر ابدا الله يطمنك بالخير بس بدي منك اجوبه محدده تكرم جروحاتك يا ابي اسال اول بشتان شو اخبار الوحده العربيه؟ اوه ما عدنا حكينا فيها يعني صرتوا بلد وحده يا ك... Okay, and that uh, concludes this talk. Um, that's uh, really, uh, you know, uh, I think the, the final scene really uh, captures a lot of the, the main sort of idea behind uh, the work and what, you know, I was trying to get at in the presentation. And so I'm happy to take any questions or comments at this time. So um, first of all, Nasri, an amazing job. Um, there are four questions in the queue and then if you have another question just type it and then i'll call on you next but let's uh marwa if you're still on and then Badr, farah and maisa let's go in that order thank you so much nisreen uh, my question was just a small detail about his earlier life he mentioned he joined the political party but without having any specific political agendas. Um, so why was he interested in, in joining a party in the first place? Um, I think that speaks to the, the fact that it was kind of uh, a sense of security, perhaps, you know, there was, um, it was a place to be outside of his home. Uh, it was a place that was, um, what, that was heated, um, and a place maybe where he could meet others. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I think, you know, everybody maybe at that time, it was sort of a common thing to join a political party, but it was sort of whether or not you chose the Ba'ath Party or the SSNP. Oops, uh, Badr, uh, you want to be up next? And Nisreen, this was fantastic. It's so Thank amazing, you. such a great presentation. Um, I was just curious to know how you perceived these um, plays, watching them as a child versus an adult, because There is a lot that, there is a lot of like Khaliji plays that I watched as a child that talk about the Gulf War and whatever. As a child, I just thought they were funny and they were great. 
mm-hmm. but watching them as an adult is a completely different story. So I was just wondering how you perceive these plays. Yeah, exactly. It was um, as a child. It was you know I enjoyed the the slapstick humor. I enjoyed the singing and dancing of, of some of them. Um, I enjoyed uh, just you know the 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 humor of it. Um, and and also like the other stuff like I mean you could tell when things were sad even as a child you know you can you can connect to a, a sad story um, as well you know like the the death of his baby for example like that was clear from a young age that that was a sad uh, turn of events um, and it, and it was as I became a teenager I kind of understood a little bit more and then when I saw them in college and then it had been a really long time and just watching them more recently for this presentation. Um, not only like the concepts and the, you know, the themes that were dealt with, but even just language wise, uh, my, my Arabic improved as I got older as well. Um, so it just, it, it basically, my admiration and sort of um, just appreciation for, for his work and, and how much it relates to our current reality uh, really came home, like was really strong for me. Uh, thank you, Nisreen, again. Although I saw your presentation in Beirut, I didn't get a chance to ask this question because it was um, a full house that night. Mm-hmm. Um, you were talking about the position of like Syrian women in the like being powerful um, symbols as the matriarch. Um, is that still valid today? Because um, like in agriculture across Lebanon, you have a lot of uh, the laborers coming from Syrian background or Syrian refugees. And a lot of the women are the ones that are doing like the, you know, backbreaking work. And when you ask around, they say that that's, it goes back to like society and um, it being just that women were always kind of the, the heavy workers. Mm-hmm. Do you know more about that? Just out of curiosity. I mean, I don't know enough about that to speak with any kind of authority on that. Um, I, I found it interesting uh, I, I mean, I found it more than interesting. I mean, I I appreciated and found it very compelling um, the the way that Mahmoud uh, and Duray Zaham, you know, Duray Zaham directed these three plays. So, you know, there was a lot of his artistic vision as well in them. Um, the way that they used imagery and uh, and and characters to sort of make the statement of of how fundamental. Um, Women were to to the to rural society as well as um, you know the, the the idea of sort of the homeland as a as a symbol. Um, so that and and I I I don't has I mean I would say that 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 continues to be true. I I feel that that's kind of a global um, thing as well. But I I can't speak with any authority on that. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Bora. Uh, Mesa. Hi, Nasreen. Thank you Hi. so much. It was a really, really interesting presentation. Um, just a quick question. Um, I, I'm not sure if you know, but do you know if his work has had renewed interest or been like reimagined in any way because of the current situation in Syria, like in maybe an anti-establishment kind of sense or mm-hmm. anything mm-hmm. like that? Um, and not that I'm personally aware of. No, I, w- I would have hoped to see more. I mean, I, um, but I haven't, I haven't seen anything, no, that, that sort of indicates that. I think there's, there's also a lot of really, you know, fresh and new works. And I think, you know, things that are happening um, that are not, that may or may not be inspired by him, but no, I, nothing that has sort of reimagined or relaunched his work specifically. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I think there's something about the relationship between theater and TV in a way that I think is very interesting. And maybe that's not so exclusive to Syria. I think, you know, we, we see that happen in Egypt. We see that happen in Lebanon. But where the kinds of theaters that translate very well to TV and to pop culture in general, which is the reason why so many people like on this Zoom room know these plays, is that it's comedy, is that it is... Otherwise, you, you can't put that kind of satire on TV if it's not also comedic. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm thinking about, like, Sadala Wanous's plays who, that are, like, much more, like, conceptual and serious. And, like, when I think of Syrian theater, like, theater with a big T, in a way, mm-hmm. that's what I think about. Right. And this strikes me less as theater and more as kind of... Um, a kind of bridge 
of story, <laughs> like a, some sort of st- weird storytelling bridge between theater and TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know, are there, do, do you have, like, have you come across anything about that relationship to TV? Because it seems so valuable. It does. And well, I think it also makes it so much more timeless. I mean, I know, you know, with the theater, mm-hmm. you can read the books. Uh, I mean, the, when they're published, you know, obviously you can read them. As far as I know, these three plays were, were, not, were never published. And really, it's just the, the live recordings are the only kind of uh, evidence of them or like, rem- mm. you know, sort of tangible thing uh, remaining of them. And, and they are broadcast. All, they, are, they were repeatedly broadcast on television. Isn't um, it state television, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the thing. So even though these plays were all uh, very, um, very critical, obviously, of, of power and, you know, very satirical, um, they both, uh, the two plays, I didn't, I wasn't able to talk about this in the presentation, but the first two plays, they are Shreen and uh, Hurbi, really are, are offering a critique of everything sort of pre asset so at the end of the Layat Tashreen, there's um, the, the sort of the, the last Mukhtar to come um, is, is the one that ultimately saves the day. And it's, uh, it sort of culminates with the Tashreen War of 1973. And so there's kind of the sense of like, oh, all of that is now behind us. We've now reached the, you know, the good ruler. And then um, with a little bit also, there's sort of at the end, this mention of, you know, the new order. That has come into be and that, that that has led to sort of prosperity. And and Mikey, you have to remember that because the plays happen in this kind of tension between urban and rural spaces, it does kind of take them out of specificity. It is very yeah. is it, it is just archetypal. It's just like good, evil, rural, urban. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, oppressed, oppressor. And it, it, and unlike again, unlike the more like political plays, it's a little bit more like linear it's more like it's very like black and white you know it's it's, it's a very a, clean line yeah it's like a Spike Lee. it's like do the right thing it's like it's all within one moment it's mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh, yeah and, and that's I, and I, that is how how they were able to kind of get away with that you know because yeah. it, it never mentions a particular country it never mentions uh any anybody or anything by name um yeah yeah so um you uh, translated Kesakiawatan as Cheers Homeland. Yeah. Um, but to me, and my Arabic is far from perfect, but uh, Watan, like, for me, implies like state more than land. Mm-hmm. And I feel like he sort of like uh, plays with that. Um, he plays with that, like, that sort of duality, this idea of like a political entity as a state. Mm-hmm. And a, being a citizen has to do with that statehood, right? Right. Uh, versus hu- being human has to do with the sort of land itself. Right. Um, uh, I actually yeah. have a comment. Uh, yeah, please. I think that the the idea, well, well, he was born around 1930s and the 40s. And I think at that time, the majority of the Arab world was kind of connected, not just through one land like Syria alone or Lebanon alone or Jordan, Palestine alone. I think they had a sense of community altogether, like being part of Sham being all together as one. So I think you, you, the translation for Watan, for example, might actually be all over because, for example, once his dad, he has having a, um, the conversation with his dad in the play, he, mm-hmm. he says what happened to Palestine, for example. Well, yeah, what, yeah. Did you guys lose it? So I, I think they do kind of have a sense of community where they're all together into this one. So the land itself, you know, in, in, um, and actually um, was uh, March... Uh, March 31st was on the, um, the day of the land for the Palestinian national, you know, land yeah. day. And um, I think we all had this sense, like as Arabs in general or as Shamis, uh, um, we have this sense of, well, you lose the land, you lose, you lose your honor. Right. So mm-hmm. his translation for Watan might have been just this land all over, like all this land, and then how we all lost it with the war, and how those uh, people are still stealing from it, and the the uh, the enemies of, of the Watan, enemies of uh, the the homeland. And I don't think it, it's supposed to be meaning, you know, it's supposed to mean one specific Watan or one specific land. I think it just it's it's it comes across as in all of them combined, and how we lost all of them combined you know, um, uh, with, the, with the history that we had. So it's pretty interesting how I felt that I also related 
to what he had to say. And I think other people can also relate to what he says, even though they live in a completely different society um, than the society that the writer, actually not just the, you know, Hawar, the character, but even the writer, uh, the, the society that the writer lived in. So it's pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I know Hannah had a, a question um, and I'm going to unmute you. Uh, okay. I hear you now. You can hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nisreen. It was really good. I really enjoyed it very much. Um, watching this from Syria is really difficult, you know, because um, it's uh, there. What you're speaking about in those plays is that something that is continuous till now, but in a more bitter situation. Yes. Now, at that time, at that time, Duret Laham was able and Maroud, they were able to put together some ideas in which they would give a portrait of, of, the, uh, of the reality that the people were living in Syria, probably in other Arab countries as well. Uh, and at that time, we thought that that would be the most bitter thing of all. So we would be watching it with tears in our eyes, the same as I was right now when I was watching you speaking. Mm-hmm. So at that time, we thought that would be the most bitter thing that we will ever, ever experience. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> when, when the current crisis happened, the last 10 years have yeah. been very difficult on Syria. And I was wondering, um, do you think that there will be possibility for, for having the same kind of um, approach towards the suffering of people? At that time, it, they, I mean, Dred Laham uh, approached it in a, in a comic way. But now, I mean, if you ask me, the way I see it on TV right now, the, the, the TV series that are being played, the Syrian ones, and uh, so they are so, I mean, they are comic, but the bitterness is so much more, so mm-hmm. you don't laugh. Right. I mean, yeah. at the time of Dured Laham, we used to laugh. I mean, it was, it was funny, even though it, it referred to a um, bitter fact. But now, it's not funny anymore, you know? Not, not the thing of Dured Laham. I'm talking about the, the lit- no, literature the general, that is happening yeah, right of now. Course. Yes, of course. Yeah. So uh, th- this is, yeah. do you think this is possible one day that we are going to... Uh, to make some, some comics and some theater st- stuff about the reality that we're living nowadays and then laugh at it? Is there a possibility? I think, of such a thing? Well, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's really hard. I think uh, we're, we're living, you know, through very tragic times and in, on many different, um, in many different contexts and on many different levels. And I yeah. think that one thing that is constant is, is uh-huh. humor. I mean, I, I know that as dark yeah. as things have gotten in Syria, there continues to be humor, there continues to be uh, sort of that human spirit that continues to try to survive. You know, I mean, we, we laugh to sort of remind ourselves that we're still living, uh, I think, and that, we're, that there is always, you know, some, some way to resist and some way to continue to, to be and not be defeated in some way. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, very hard to say, you know, what will... Probably it's when you are inside the crisis, you can't laugh. But then after you finish it, and after you look back, mm-hmm. and then that's mm-hmm. when you, you can see the comic side of it. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe um, the jokes will keep you surviving. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. I think... Um, uh, Thank you very much, Nisreen. Thank you very much. Have you me, I think it's probably about time to wrap up. Um, so yeah, I'm we can... Send it back to you. Thanks. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, thanks, Nisreen, for Thank sharing uh, for sharing your research with us. Thanks, guys, and a huge Thank thanks you. to Nisreen. Thank you, Nisreen. Thank you, Nisreen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.